How about this one? Can any... Okay, you can hear me? Okay, good. Hey, everybody, look, I'm human just like everybody else. I am in a hotel room and I got my camera, my microphone, and uh, I got five thumbs when it comes to audio visual. So um, thank you for being patient with me as I get this thing uh, sorted out. But I'm really, really excited about what's gonna happen today. And I also want to go ahead and, and put this up on Instagram Live. So um, that's also something that I'm five thumbs on. So let me let me go ahead and do that. Take off my conference badge. And three, two, one on Instagram. Let's get started. Um, yep, so I'm Instagram Live as well. So hey, everybody, I'm super excited about today. Um, Thanks for tuning in. And okay, you said you could barely hear me. So what's up with that? So how's the volume? Check one, two, check one, two. Um, is that better? Okay, loud and clear, awesome. Well, hey, I have a few special guests today. And um, of course, the whole premise of me doing this masterclass is to talk about three things. It's to talk about <clears throat> what happened. What happened over these last few years uh, in commercial real estate and specifically in multifamily real estate and then the whole world that I specialize in, which is in multifamily syndication. So Teresa Velasquez said no sound, but <clears throat> it's occurring to me that everybody, um, if you can hear me, let me know. So Teresa, that must be on your end. Okay, so we should be good to go on sound. We should be good to go on AV. So if you can't hear me and you can't see me, then um, the sound is probably on your end, okay? So um, super excited to be here. We're gonna talk about what happened. We're gonna talk about what is happening and we are gonna talk about what to do. And so um, we won't be on here for any more than an hour. I've also uh, put out to my team to have you bring your questions. And so before we finish up, uh, we will take live questions. 
whether um, you know we we have you type them in or on Instagram or whatever. So super excited about this. And I want to also bring up on the screen our special guests. And along with me today on the instructor panel is my good friend and uh, my CPA, uh, Tom Wheelwright, who's also associated with the Rich Dad Companies and does a lot of speaking and authoring uh, along with Robert Kiyosaki. And we can see Tom here with all of his, uh, many of his books in the background. How you doing, Tom? Good, Brad. Good to be with you. I, I love the topic. Now, I'm Tom, I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Can anybody, can everybody hear Tom hear or is it just me? Okay. Well, let me, let me set, let me do something okay. here with my, well, that would be you, Brad. What is up with that? <laughs> Tom, could you say something again? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Now, can okay. you can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear okay. you just fine. Well, hey, the problem was on my end. <laughs> but, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so look, man, I got my Brad. We call that a picnic problem, right? Problem in chair, not in computer. Well, look, we got the <laughs> external mic, the external camera, and I'm in a hotel, and I don't have my team with me, uh, and they're doing the best I can to support me. So, hey, lesson number one, everybody. Whether you're doing multifamily syndication or you're doing Zoom meetings to hundreds of people, you need to have a team that knows what they're doing <laughs> no surrounding you. So just take note of that. Um, and I also have another guest instructor, and he's also a good friend of mine. We've known each other for years and years and years. Mr. Robert Helms, the host of the Real Estate Radio Show. Hey, Robert. Hey, Brad. Hi, Tom. Good to see you. I also have all of Tom's books behind me. <laughs> I, I see you have an entire library. I, I love that. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Indeed. So, so hey, let's just kick this off. So, um, for for Tom and Robert, you know, because we we had a a preview about what we're going to talk about, but let's let's the three of us talk about really what happened these last few years in commercial real estate and in the multifamily arena. Um, I'll start by just saying, look. Anybody that claims that they were able to forecast what was going to happen, I don't believe them because what happened with the Fed raising interest rates somewhere along the lines of 14 times in a very short period of time was unprecedented, which means it's never happened before in history. And I'm not saying that it'll never happen again, but it's probably unlikely that it'll happen again. Um, and so what do you guys say about that? Well, so I, I think what's important is to understand what that means um, to the valuation, because remember that um, value of real estate is uh, based on cap rate, right? And cap rate is um, net operating income divided by price. That's that's what cap rate is. If cap rate uh, goes down, value or price goes up. But if cap rate goes up, then value goes down. Well, if all of a sudden your cap rate goes from three to six, you've just cut your value in half. It's a direct inverse relationship. Okay. So because of that, the bank's going, well, wait a minute, we don't want these properties back. We want to make sure that the interest is paid. So we're going to ask for these rate caps. We're going to have you pay in to make sure that we don't get these back because the cap rates just went up and that the value is not there. We're going to lose a ton of money. And so the, the banks are basically saying, you know, this is clearly the Fed put us into this problem in the first place. They're the ones who kept the interest rates artificially low. And they're the ones that, that raised them so fast. Like you said, Brad, it's unprecedented. And, and I think that, frankly, you know, for, for anybody to suggest that it is the fault of the industry is like they're in la-la land. This is the Fed did this. The Fed's responsible, period. I, I love that perspective, Tom. And before I ask Robert, the other thing that happened that I want to mention is it's not only the rise of interest rates, it's this inflationary environment. And so if you remember, you know, the Fed printed $5 trillion during the pandemic and, and paid people not to work. And so somehow we got create we got into this highly inflationary environment. Um, a lot of projects got uh, brought to a standstill. And for a period of time, we didn't see a lot of new inventory coming online. Now we have an excess of inventory coming online. So in a lot of the top markets in the country, we have more supply than demand that's going to be temporary, I believe. But we have a lot of new units coming online that's impacting, especially the A-class with vacancies and such and such. And 
Also, expenses have skyrocketed. So this is not just about interest rates, but you know, labor costs have went up. Um, repair costs have gone up. Uh, capital improvement costs have gone up. You know, we bought properties where we would budget sixteen hundred dollars to put in a new appliance package, and now it's twenty eight hundred. So what that means is we can't upgrade as many units as we had budgeted. And so, you know, it's harder and harder to get things done with the budget of the amounts that we had, you know, the last few years. Insurance has gone up. I just saw a post, and Tom, that's that's a great comment about value. So, um, you know, I just saw a post on social media where somebody was talking about how their property insurance doubled. And it went from, you know, 200,000 to five to 400,000. And, you know, this was like a 200 some unit property and the, the price of insurance doubled because of all the claims that were happening in that part of Florida. And so as a result, just that increase in expenses from 200,000 to 400,000 decreased the value of the property by like $2.8 million. So these are some of the things that have happened. Robert, what's your take on all this? Well, obviously, I agree with what you guys have uh, painted so far. I think there's a couple of things to consider. First of all, cap rate is determined by the market. So that's confusing to some people. Cap rates are different in different marketplaces. And so what's happened in the last few years is based on what the market does, change the cap rates, people make decisions about whether or not to buy or sell. You might have been sitting on a 300-unit apartment building, everything's going along, and all of a sudden, the cap rate changes such that now you're thinking about selling. Maybe it was in your plan to sell in five to seven years, three years in. Well, I'll sell because the cap rate tells me I should. Or on the other hand, it might say, no, now's the time to buy more. So I think there's that. And then interest rates, right? What's happened to interest rates has been phenomenal. Not that they're that high. They're really not. Uh, our mutual friend, the three of us, Ken McElroy, uh, he and I were talking a few months back and he goes, you know, during the time you and I have been investing, Robert, we've been investing almost exactly the same amount of time. He said the average interest rate that we've paid on real estate is higher than the rates right now. And that's true today. If you've only invested in the last three, four, five, 10 years, you think rates are high, but they're really not that high. It does have an effect. I think going into that, the part about what happened was folks made decisions. They made decisions about to buy or not to buy a rate cap. They made decisions about the length of the loan, if they were going to use temporary or bridge loans. And there was a lot of reasons to consider that kind of financing. But in the light of day, uh, sometimes that uh, sh was shown not to be prudent. Again, I don't think anybody really called it for the reasons. If you say, hey, you know, experts predict prices will go either up or down in the future. Well, then you're right. But it's hard to find someone that called it for all the specific reasons and they got all the facts right. That's not how markets happen. Markets are going to do what they're going to do. We're going to do our best to react. And I think it is important. I know a lot of people are on because they want to know, is it is it time to put your foot on the gas or is it time to put on your... We'll get to that. But I think it's important that you have this context of where it's been, especially if you've never invested in apartments. Is there a chance that you should be sitting out the next few years and letting the dust clear? Or is there a reason to get in? And could it be a good time to get in? That's what we'll be talking about. Yeah. So let's let's talk about like what's happening now. And, you know, we have a few perspectives on that. So like one perspective is, hey, there's a group of us out there and I'm in this category because I'm in over 30 apartment syndications right now. And most of them are doing well, but there's a few that have challenges. And so, you know, where where are we at with things right now? And so one is if you're an operator or an investor and you invested in the last few years, we'll talk about that. So that'll be one perspective. The next perspective would be you want to sell your property. And so where are we at right now as a seller? And I'm a seller right now. So I want to remind, I want to share with you exactly what I'm experiencing right now as a seller. And then third, what does that mean as a buyer? And so let's open that up. Um, Tom, do you want to speak to that a little bit before we? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so what, what we're seeing is, and of course we have, um, not just you, but a lot of clients that are, uh, in the development area, um, in multifamily and, uh, what we're seeing is that there's, there's still a disconnect and the disconnect is between what the, uh, it's a willing buyer, willing seller, right? Price is willing buyer, willing seller. That's the definition of fair market value. Okay. But the sellers, their price is different that they're willing to sell at 
than the ask price, that's the ask price, right? Than what the buyer is willing to pay, which is the bid price. And the bid and the ask are really far apart right now. And, and I think what's going on is that people have this hope. <laughs> they are living on hope. Syndicators are living on hope that the interest rates are going to come down soon enough that it makes sense. With, and, and of course, if interest rates come down, it, it's not just costs that come down. Interest rates come down, cap rates come down. If I can, let me kind of explain why that cap rate is so important, not just in the valuation, but people are deciding every day, where do I put my money? Investors are deciding every day, where do I put my money? Well, if I can get 5% on a completely zero risk treasury bond, okay, and I can get 5% in a more risky investment, I'm going to put my money in the treasury bond, period. Okay. Now, real estate is always more risky by definition than a treasury bond. It's the least risky investment by definition in, in the world. So, as, as if the interest rate goes up, then people pull out of one asset class, say real estate, they put it in another asset class. And that's why the valuation changes with the cap rate. It's really a it's really the investor's expectation of return on their cash investment. That's what it is. Yeah. Then on top of that, you add these interest rates where you actually budgeted when you paid for it, you budget you you paid for it based on this lower this lower cap rate. Now the interest rate goes up. So effectively your cash available to pay out to investors in some cases has gone to zero and in some cases it's gone below zero. Yeah. As you know, Brad. So so I, I think that there's this, I still think there's a disconnect. I think we're gonna see more towards the end of the year. I personally think we're gonna see more defaults. Um, people just saying, you know what, this isn't going to turn around fast enough. I think the capital calls, um, while they're going to go out, I think they're going to be harder to fulfill um, because I don't think anybody thinks inflation right now, based on yesterday's data, I don't think anybody thinks inflation is going away anytime soon. Yeah. So it doesn't occur to me that rates are going to be cut as soon or as fast as we had hoped. Right. Uh, or as much and as fast or as soon as we had hoped based on all the reports. And I saw somebody post in here and in, uh, in the chat box that hope is not a strategy. So I agree with that. So what is a strategy? Well, look, if you're in deals right now, we got to be doing some re forecasting, some re underwriting. You know, we got to be diligent on operations. We got to be looking at costs. Like there's a lot of deals out there. Like here's an example. I bought a deal in 2021. Many of the students in my program are familiar with this deal. Uh, we saw it on a Sumrock, you know, student bus tour. And bought it in 2021. We have a three-year variable rate loan. We bought we bought a rate cap, um, and the deal is producing cash flow, like a lot of cash flow. But what we've done is we've decided not to make distributions because we know that at some point in the future, and that point in the future could be July of 2024, where we would need to buy another rate cap. And that rate cap is dramatically more expensive now than it was three years ago when we bought the deal. So this rate cap cost us five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars. And so what we've done is we've accumulated that cash in the event that we want to do the rate cap. So that's one thing that we're doing. You know, <clears throat> the other thing is we've been looking at different strategies. So of course we went out and got BOVs, broker opinions of value. We want to see what it is that we could sell the property for. We've also engaged with lenders. And we're looking at refinancing options. And so we're looking at agency refinancing, CMBS refinancing. We're even looking at bridge refinancing. And some people might say, oh, my God, like a bridge loan, that's the worst thing you could do. I respectfully don't uh, necessarily agree with that. There is a time and a place for a bridge loan. In fact, one of my operators that I partnered with, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's got a lot more experience than I don't know everybody on the call here, but he's got a lot more doors and a lot more experience than probably anyone on this call. And we just did um, what's called a bridge to bridge refinance. So we had a three year bridge and we paid that off and we got another three year bridge because the belief there is that by 2027, we're gonna be in a completely different you know, time where things are gonna be booming again. Yeah. And so I I, I agree, Brad. I, I I think the question is how far down the road do you need to kick the can, right? Yeah. Well, from what I'm hearing, from what I'm hearing from the experts is 
you know, there's a saying in the industry, Tom, survive until 25. And everything that I hear is saying like 26 is going to be like some amazing times again. So some of the most experienced in the industry professionals that are debt uh, advisors are telling us like, you know, get that. So in this deal, it was a 620 unit A-class deal that we bought at the end of 2020. And we just did a cash neutral refinance, meaning our original loan was 86 million. We actually have a new loan of 95 million. Uh, and so there's a 7 million surplus, but we went ahead with part of that 7 million and actually had to buy that rate cap for the next several years, but we're good to go through mid 2026 on that transaction. Now, now the other one that I'm looking at that I mentioned that I bought in 2021, our income is through the roof, okay? Meaning that right. our rental income, we're, we're in year three and we've already surpassed our year five rental income. So like we've done our job of doing the value add upgrades, of raising the rents. Um, our controllable expenses are in line with our budget, okay? But it's the interest rate, even though we have a cap, and it's also the thing, the uncontrollable expenses like insurance and such and such and supplies and, 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 and contract labor and all that, all those things have gone up. And so we're in a great position on this deal. We can sell the deal and get all the investor money back and still make a profit, but it won't be the amount of profit that we had projected to make. Or we're actually looking at a refinance that would involve a cash out. Now it won't be a big cash out, but it'll be a cash out. So to me, if you could do a cash out refinance right now, or even a cash neutral refinance, because I'm also hearing about groups that need to do a cash in refinance, meaning you would need to put money in the deal um, to pay off the existing loan and to get new debt. And so if you're in a position where you could do a cash out or cash neutral refinance, I think you're in a pretty good position. Robert, Tom, any comments on that? Yeah, I think, you know, you're talking about the folks that are in right now and what they can do. And, you know, there's this feeling that the market's distressed. And I think we can all agree, you know, this as Tom mentioned, that we're going to see some of that. But the entire market isn't distressed. In fact, it's the minority of the actual properties that are truly in distress. There are some. And if you're in one of those, that's a problem. There are absolutely deals that were done in the last three, four, five years that are underwater now. The price per door is down 20 or 30 percent. Well, what was the initial equity? 20 or 30 percent. There are deals, yep. make no mistake, where 100 percent of the equity is gone. Now, it might not stay that way if you can survive through 25 or 26. But for those deals... That looks like everything is over and it's bleak and it might be. But again, that's not the market. There are plenty of deals where folks were prudent about underwriting and bought the rate caps and maybe expenses are up. But guess what else happens in an inflationary environment? Rents go up and values go up. So it's it's so local. All real estate is local. You can't really say the real estate market and you can't say the apartment market because it varies so much. So I think the big uh, lesson is to make sure that you are staying plugged in, because if you just set it and forget it, the market can run away from you. Well, well, and and you know, I I kind of think back to two thousand eight, nine, and ten, right? And people, clients would call and they say, "Well, I don't want to sell this property because I'm going to lose money." And and my my question back is always, "Would you buy the property at the price you're selling it?" Because if you'd buy it at the price you're selling it, you should keep it. Right. Right. If you if you don't, if you wouldn't buy the property at the price you're you you'd sell it at net of expenses, then you should sell it. And let's let's get rid of that bad asset on your balance sheet. Yeah. Okay. But but you really have to to evaluate, as you're saying, Brad, you really have to evaluate the deal and every aspect of the deal is that it we, we can't, like was said in the chat, hope is not a strategy. At the same time, you can look at it and say, is this an underperforming asset or is this a non-performing asset? If it's an underperforming asset, perhaps there are things we can do to increase the performance. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like, do we do we actually go put money in to raise the rents so that 
we can, you know, get more, more rent per, per unit. Maybe that's an answer. You know, maybe there's some, some, some rehab we need to do some value add that we need to do because those, and, and then the other thing that I, of course, I can't forget to add is that don't forget that if you do give up the property, you will have a tax consequence and it could be a major tax consequence because most of these properties got a hundred percent bonus depreciation when you bought them. And when, when, the, if you give it back or you sell it, remember that unless you do a, some type of a 1031 exchange or a drop and swap, then you're going to end up, or you're in a DST, something like that, then you're going to end up with a, a major capital gain. So, so don't forget that there's a tax cost to this. It's not just the selling cost. There's a tax cost. Yeah. And I love that, Tom, because one of the questions I get from a lot of people, whether they're students in my mentoring program, my mastermind, or just people that I meet at like a conference where I'm at now, and I'll talk about that. I know some people have asked where I'm at, um, is, hey, I'm in a deal with a capital call and should I contribute? So like one of my thoughts on that is like, look, number one is everybody that got into a deal very well should understand the risks. Like I know we like to talk about the potential and the ways we make money, you know, cash flow, appreciation, tax savings, all that type of stuff. But I also think we need to be aware of the downsides and the risks. And I know like in my program, like I, I teach that and I make sure that people understand that. Does that mean people will always listen? No, but it's very clear. Like, look, I've started this business in 2020 in 2002 and I've been through the 2008 crisis and I know what it's like to have challenges. And so you know, I think just being aware of what these challenges could be and, and knowing that any given deal could potentially, even if you do everything right, you know, could still have challenges due to climate and geopolitical events and election years and all that type of stuff and pandemics and the feds and all that type of stuff. So part of it is that. And there's also the part that we can control as owner operators. And so if there is a capital call, like what I would advise to the GP team is you need to have a very clear plan for what you're going to do with that money and basically a reforecast because it's like, okay, well, here's what we did forecast. And by the way, these are projections. They're not promises. And sometimes I hear, well, they didn't do what they promised. And I would say, no, they they didn't do what they projected. So let's, let's clarify, sure. be accurate with our language here. But it, nonetheless, what we should be doing as GPs, if we are seeking additional equity is put together. Here's where we're at now. And here's where we project to be in the next three to five years. And here's the light at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> and what occurs to me is if you still believe in the asset, if you believe in the market, you know, if you believe in the industry, if you believe in your team and your capabilities, like in past performance is no guarantee of what will happen now, but I've been in challenge deals in 2008, nine and 10 and came out the other side. So you know, I would never say uh, never contribute to a capital call. I would never say always contribute to a capital call. I would just say you want to evaluate. But Tom brought up a good point because if these deals don't get funded, <clears throat> um, there could be a tax consequence as well, you know, on that uh, situation. Um, I do want to share my own experience of what's happening now as a seller and what that means for us as, as buyers. And so, in 2023, in the beginning of the year, I have three deals that are not syndications. And many of my students know this, but it occurs to me we have a lot of new people online that may not have uh, been in my mentoring program. And so I listed three deals at the beginning of January 2023, one sold within 60 days on time at full ask price. And I feel fortunate because that was before things really started to get worse. Another deal, the buyer tied me up for six months, never closed. But fortunately, we found another buyer in the middle of 2023, and we closed in September of 2023. And that deal took eight months. It went from January 2023, closed in September. So that's nine months. And let me tell you about that transaction, because now it's closed. We have listed that property at $17 million. Um, That was the whisper price. A so whisper price is a price that the broker and me as the seller agree upon, and we provide pricing guidance to the buyer community. Um, and the first buyer had it under contract at 17 million. 
<clears throat> they didn't close. It took them five months to walk away from the deal because they could not get their debt together or their equity together. The next buyer closed the deal at 15.4 million. So during that nine month period, my property value went down from 17 million to 15.4. And I still made money. Don't so feel sorry for me because we bought it you know, in 2018 at a really good price. But that was the opportunity that buyer group had. Now, the last part of the story is um, the third deal. And I listed this third deal at the same time, January of 2023, and we got a buyer that tied me up for eight months. They couldn't close. They couldn't get their equity together. And after eight long months, frustrating long months for me, they walked away from the deal. Um, we took it out at about $16 million. They had a contract at about $16 million. The brokers relisted the property in January this year. There was tremendous interest. They created an amazing market. We had 770 confidentiality agreements signed, meaning they requested the financials from the broker. 770, 35 purchasing groups toured the property. And we had 13 offers in four groups or five groups made it to the best and final. And so what this tells me is the brokers did their job. They created the market. They created a lot of interest. Wouldn't you agree, Robert and Tom? Like they did no. their job. Yep. And I'm yep, not going to sure. tell and I'm not going to tell you the exact price because it's still in play. Like we're we've we picked the buyer, we have agreed on a price, we're signing the contract. But let me just tell you that 18 months ago we took it out at 16 million. And let me let me do the math here. We are going to be selling it for below 14 million. Let me just put it wow. to you that way. And I don't want to give you the exact number yet, but we're going to be selling this deal for let more than $2 million for less, $2 million less than we would have 18 months ago. And, and let me tell you something, this is not a variable rate loan. I don't have to buy a rate cap. I am not a distressed seller. Tom knows my tax returns. Tom, do I have money in the bank? Uh, you're willing me to say that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, do I have money in the bank? I'm yeah, not a distressed seller. So why am I selling? Same thing that Tom said. If I had to buy the property today, knowing that the property needs 800000 to a million dollars in improvements, I'm the major investor in the deal, the majority owner. If I keep the property, I'm going to have to put in that 800000 to a million dollars, and then I'm going to have to oversee the CapEx. And that's not something I want to do right now with my money and my time. I believe there's better opportunities for me to get my money out, even though I'm selling at more than a 20% discount, and I'm going to get my money out and redeploy it into something else and get a better return. So that's why I'm selling. And uh, that's where I see the opportunity. Tom or Robert, any, any comments on that? I think it's a great uh, real world right now case study of yeah. what has been happening. And we're we've seen price per door go down a lot. So I guess one of the fundamental questions, if we're ready to shift to that, is if apartment buildings are on sale, they cost less per door now uh, than they did uh, even a year ago. Then is this a time to buy? And is that enough reason well, to buy? I think that might be an interesting thing so, to discuss. So, 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 so let's look at when, you know, when, when you want to buy, because what's important is that your cap rate's higher than your interest rate. Right. If your cap rate's not higher than your interest rate, it's not <laughs> you only make money if you pay cash. Right. So if you're trying to syndicate a deal, you're trying to borrow money, you're using other people's money, you're using the bank's money. Um, if if your cap rate is at five and your interest rates at six, that's a bad deal. That dog that's doesn't hunt. A, that is, that's called, um, in Australia, they call that negative gearing. And it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea in Australia and it's a bad idea in every, everywhere else in the world. So, so that's really, to me, that's what you're looking at. If your rents are strong, I mean, Brad, one of the things that I heard you talking about is, are the fundamentals good? And that's where you've got to really look at that deal. I have a question for you, Brad, though, if I can. I want to ask you this question. So I've seen some syndicators where they've done a capital call and they've said, look, 
the value for the original investors is gone and only the and the return is 100% going to go to the people that put in the capital call money and the original investors are going to get nothing. What do you think of that? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by that one. I, I kind of get where they're going from a math standpoint. Wait, say that, say that again. I didn't follow that. Okay. So let's say, let's say that there was um, $10 million of equity. And let's say that because of the interest rate cap rates, the equity, now there's no equity. Robert, Robert's example. So they, but they have a capital call. And the reason they have the capital call is because they think they can get the equity back in another two years, say, let's say you do a capital year, capital call enough to cover two years. Like you said, get to 2026. All right. What they're doing is, is they're saying only those investors who fund the capital call get any money back. Those who, investors who were the original investors, they're done. Yeah, I guess I haven't come across that situation, but it doesn't, um, maybe I don't understand it. But to me, I would look at the company agreement and say like, hey, like, like, cause to me, it almost seems like it, 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 it occurs to me that that's almost like saying, Hey, the original equity is gone and we're essentially selling it to these new investors. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's what they're doing. That's, a, that's exactly it, what's going on. It doesn't occur to me that like, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with, um, you know, I'm in 37 syndications right now and I've had a couple capital calls and I can tell you that's not what we're doing. I so, know you're not. Are those, are those I doing? know what you're doing, I, Brad. I yeah, just, I wanted, I wanted, and I'd like to hear from you too, Robert, what your thoughts are on that. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm severely challenged by it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I have seen this. And I think the reaction is that if you say, okay, based on today's value, there is no equity. So the equity holders, they're, they're out of luck. And either the bank is going to take this over and then we're all out, or perhaps we're going to have, you know, a, a recapitalization. Well, how to recapitalize if the value isn't there. But follow me on this. Would it be conceivable that even though the equity is quote unquote not there, would it be conceivable that the property could still perform maybe at a neutral basis, maybe a little bit of a feed, maybe a little bit positive, still perform as time goes on, rents come up, as time goes on, the economy is different and you could hang on and then all of a sudden the equity's back. See, the equity isn't actually gone until you sell. Exactly. That's so, my point. If, yeah. you, if you sold, that could be one option. Hey, guys, we're out. We're going to sell to one other group. Do anyone, any of you want to be part of the other group? I don't like the way that feels as a syndicator, yeah. but I can see the level of thinking there. To me, I would rather figure out a way to reward current members who can make a cash call in a proportionate way. So if 60% of the members can make a cash call, okay, we're going to do something for that group. Everyone's eligible, treat them all equally, but yeah. the ones that can come up, we'll do this for, and the ones that can't, well, you're going to have to ride along with us. Yeah. Well, Hey, I want to, you guys noticed I put up a slide here. I'm curious where y'all think we're at in the market cycle. If we compared the market cycle to a clock, um, <clears throat> you know, to me, it occurs to me that, we're definitely past the five o'clock period. Now, I don't know if we've hit six. Uh, it doesn't occur to me that we've hit seven, but seven is 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 the talk of what could happen in the near future. And it's what we're all anticipating. And then of course, we just saw Blackstone went in and, and deployed $10 billion into uh, multifamily, which to me occurs that they believe we're somewhere in that bottom of the cycle. So. Uh, Tom and Robert, where do you think we're at here? Soon as you put that up, I my my eye went right to five thirty. So yeah. I think we're 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 closing That's it on six think. o'clock. I yeah, think we're at so, five thirty. Yeah, it's, so this, it's always five o'clock somewhere. Right. <laughs> well, this this is where I this is why I think like I want to transition here because I want to honor our time commitments to finish mm -hmm. by the top of the hour. This this is my opinion, and you know, Tom and Robert, I didn't ask you this yet, so you guys could you know share your own opinions, but. To me, the reason I'm bullish on buying, and I'm going to talk about why, is that, you know, back at that peak here where, you know, would say was somewhere in mid-2022, you know, what I've heard was like, hey, hey, it's different this time, and this is going to keep going, and we're going to have free money forever, and cap rates are never going to go up. And that was the time in hindsight to be really cautious. 
But now what's happening is we're down sort of toward that bottom of the cycle where it says like, hey, it's best to be, I hate the word greed, but it's best to be putting our foot on the gas right now and looking for opportunities. Um, there's a lot of deals for sale in different states of distress. So I want, I'm one of them. I don't need to sell, but I want to sell because I don't want to deal with the CapEx that I need to deal with. There are people that their deals are performing well on the income side, but they don't want to buy the rate caps. Maybe they don't want to do a $2 million cash in refinance. Um, maybe they're in a three-year bridge loan and it's coming due and they have the option to extend, but they don't meet all of the hurdles that the lender is put in front of them to get that extension. And so maybe they need to put a couple million in. So they're considering you know, getting out of the asset. And I'm seeing that a lot right now. So when, when, you know, when a lot of us here are distressed, we are thinking we could go in and buy it for 70 cents, eight, 60 cents on a dollar. And those types of opportunities may be out there. But what I'm seeing is more like, hey, let's get a deal. Let's get a solid deal at a great basis where there's some value add component. And Tom, one of the things that I would take exception to what you said is, you know, if I could buy a deal at a six cap and I could still get a 6% loan, <clears throat> but there's a big value add component in there. Yeah, like sure. every, every deal I do is I'm going to put together yeah. a five year uh, projection. And if I could demonstrate in that projection that I could go in with proven strategies, I'm not talking about speculation, but I'm talking about proven efficiencies with, you know, water conservation, payroll, you know, finding direct rental comps that have rents two or $300 a month higher with certain unit upgrades. And I could go in and do those upgrades. That's where I would say, hey, look, you know, it's okay to do a deal in situations where your five-year projection is very solid and conservative, but still shows a lot of upside. So to me, you know, I'm looking at these reasons to be in now. So let's talk about this a little bit because like we keep getting these reports where the economy is performing strong. And again, there's this is arguable. It's like, are these part-time employments? Is employment really going up? Is it full-time? Is it part-time? What's really happening? Is somebody manipulating the data? It's an election year. But I can tell you like, there's a lot of things happening for good in the industry why I'm pretty bullish on it. And, you know, Tom, we also know that apartments offers some of the best tax advantages available. Yeah, no, 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 for sure. And and if you go, if you went back to that previous uh, graph, I, 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 the one before that, yeah, that one, I have the feeling that we're kind of in between denial and fear right now. We're, we're, we're not, we're not into the panic or the despondency yet, but a question I have for you, Brad is, um, I think something that a lot of people are very anxious about is what's going on in the world. You have war in the Middle East, you have war in, in Europe, um, in Eastern Europe, and then you've got this possibility of war in China. Um, so how will that affect, I mean, because I think this goes to your, you know, your nine, nine things. If you look at these nine, how are they affected by a major uh, world conflict? Well, there are things that could derail this, like, you know, like the pandemic would never have been in anybody's vocabulary um, until we had a pandemic, right? And so, yeah, like if if the uh, if the war in the Middle East breaks out into you know a wider conflict, or Russia Ukraine breaks out into a wider conflict, or we have a contested election that's decided by you know not by the electorate but by you know Congress or whatever, there could be um, things happening you know that that could that could impact things. Um, I re I remember in 2016. When Trump won the election, I was in escrow to buy a $30 million, 300 unit deal. And we had penciled the deal out at like a 4.2% interest rate. And Trump won. And it occurs to me that he wasn't supposed to win, meaning like nobody, the markets and the, the capital markets and Wall Street didn't expect him to win. And he did. And we ended up closing that deal at a 5% rate instead of 4.2. I mean, rates went crazy for about a two month period. So there are there are things, you know, that can happen. But that being said, like to me, um, and I want to I want to move forward and and try to you know reach some conclusions here. But to me, the best time to start anything is like, look, I've been doing this 22 years. If somebody told me they wanted to lose weight, Tom, I wouldn't say, well, hey, wait until 
you know, the world calms <laughs> down. I would say like, let's let's start your exercise program now, even when you're traveling and even when times are hard and even if you have a lot going on, it's better to start now. And that's why, like, I've been questioned about this. You know, I, I've been questioned about like, Brad, was it really great to start two years ago? Well, hindsight is always 2020. But what I could tell you is <clears throat> there's a huge affordability gap between the cost of buying a single family home, especially for a working family. And and that's my point, Brad, is I actually think if you look at these nine, right, fundamentals are strong. Are they going to be strong for a while? Yes, we still have a housing shortage. Uh, There's still a shortage. Um, Homes are still, homes have a bigger price gap than multifamily has in my mind. Uh, You you have people pulling out um, because they're dropping out. Right. So so you have less competition. I'm thinking that these these not the tax benefits aren't going to get better. I mean, frankly, that right now we've got 60 percent bonus depreciation goes to 40 percent next year. Right. So that's a that's a much better. And then inflation je- definitely favors apartments. And so I'm just saying that that even with a a, a conflict, people still need a place to live. Right. Exactly. They, they still need to eat. They, st- you know, so there, you, when you look at a conflict, cause, uh, cause you know, you know, I meet, I, I spend time with Ki- Robert Kiyosaki all the time. And you know, when we're talking about what's going on, well, where do you put your money? I'm going, it's always comes down to hard assets, you know, uh, real estate, energy, agriculture. I mean, those are the hard assets, right? Well, agriculture is tough and energy. The challenge is you're so dependent on price. The, the price fluctuates so great that let's say that, for example, let's say the Democrats were to sweep, uh, the, the Republicans were to sweep, not the Democrats, but the Republicans were to sweep in November, you would see oil prices drop precipitously very quickly. Okay, just like they went up precipitously, uh, they went up so fast when, when Biden w- was elected. I mean, it was like day one, they went up. And so I think that with real estate, the the nice thing is that if you look at the fundamentals, which I, you are always teaching, Brad, and that's what I love about your classes, is you're always teaching the fundamentals. This is what you're looking at. Make sure that you have strong cash flow regardless of the interest rate. Make sure you have strong cash flow regardless of of the of of the uh, the the cost of insurance. You know, look at those fundamentals, and then what the the price does doesn't matter so much. Yeah. And Tom, I, I went ahead and took the liberty to to hit my clicker here because, you know, we, we do want to finish up in 10 minutes and I want to address like what to do. And Tom, that was a perfect segue because I tell you what I'm doing right now and I'm doing this with my mentees and I'm doing this myself as I'm refocusing on the fundamentals of the business. OK, and it's more important now than ever that we really understand that we're doing And what I do and what I teach is there's a proven framework for success. There's a more efficient, better way to approach this business. And there's a less efficient, less effective way to approach this business. And so number one is you want to understand the deal. You really want to recommit and remaster. And if you're new, you want to commit to learn and master the fundamentals, meaning what does it mean to understand the deal? What does it mean to understand NOI, cap rate, the business model? controllable expenses, uncontrollable expenses, different ways to raise income, you know, raise to ways to manage the asset, KPIs and stuff like that. You want to understand that. You want to have a consistent source of deal flow from owners and brokers and investor communities. Like now more than ever, we need to be looking at deals and there's a lot of deals out there. And when you when you find them, you need to learn how to analyze them. You need to do the market analysis. You need to do the financial analysis. Then there's the whole funding piece. We have a debt component. We have an equity component. So you want to optimize the type of debt you get, whether it's agency, uh, fixed rate, variable rate, you know, recourse, non-recourse. You want to understand that and select the right option that fits your business plan. And then there's the whole equity side as far as like, where do you get the money to go out and find these deals? And then finally, we got to get the deal to the finish line and understand all the steps that one would need to successfully close the deal and then also understand that that's when the work actually starts by effectively managing the deal and then managing the asset. So this is what I'm focusing on. This is what I think people should be focusing on. And then the other part would be, how do I invest? And the three ways I've invested, 
and I, I refer this back to Tom because he knows this because he does my tax returns, is you could do your own deals with your own money. You could be part of a syndication group where you could be a passive investor or you could be on the general partnership team. Tom, Robert, any comments about that? So I'm a big fan of investing all three of these ways. And I think that there's some, you know, when we talk about timing, uh, first of all, the most important part about timing is where you are and when you're ready. And the greatest news I bullet points is the competition. The world thinks it's a terrible time to buy. The world thinks interest rates are too high. The world thinks there's no deals. People are buying into all that fear. Awesome. There is going to be a lot less competition and there's going to be deals where people need to get out. So I think it's an excellent time. If you are not up to speed with getting trained on how to become an apartment business owner, now's the time. You can own in your own account. Love to do that. That's how you started, Brad, right? Your first property was a 32-unit apartment building. But the other two have a lot of power when you're group purchasing through a private placement or syndication or even a TIC or, or Delaware Statutory Trust. But the idea that you can be a passive investor and come alongside a team that has it figured out, has relationships, has been there, or you can be the person that makes that jump from, I've already got a lot of experience, I know some markets well, and now you want to be the person that raises the capital. I think there's going to be great opportunity there. As Tom talked about early, when the difference between the bid and the ask starts to get closer, which it already is, there is going to be opportunity. And there's always a distressed property and a don't want her. And we are solutionists as real estate investors. We figure out a way to provide solutions to the market. And I think this market is going to need a lot of solutions. Yeah. And, yeah. and let me add one more thing to this, Brad, is that there is a misunderstanding and it's caused, frankly, by my profession, um, the CPA profession, tax advisory profession. That is that you don't, you cannot deduct passive losses. That is false. On its face, that's false. Okay. The, the, the rule is you can deduct passive losses against passive income. So one of the questions is then if I can't, you know, if, if it's passive, how do I create passive income? So you, th my point is, is that a lot of this is who's on your team. You know, you talk about that a lot, Brad, you were talking about it in that previous slide that who's the, t who's that team and make sure that now I think you need a much better team than you needed three years ago, three years ago, anybody can make money. Yeah. Right in in multifamily yeah. today, you need a strong team because you need those experts. That because that that tax, I mean, you think about it, the tax part of the investment is such a major part of your cash, okay, and such a major part of the deal that if you don't have a a, a really strong tax person who really understands how it works in the syndicate at the syndication level and the passive level, then you're just gonna uh, you're just gonna throw away the biggest, really, I think one of the biggest benefits to investing in real estate. Well, and Tom, you've you've helped me a lot with that. And that's why, like, look, I, I want to just say, like, a lot of people ask me, like, Brad, can you help me do all this? And the answer is yes. Like, this is one of the things that we do. I have two businesses. I've done 57 apartment investments, and most of them are syndications. And I'm in over 30 syndications right now. So that's one of my businesses is I own, invest, and syndicate apartments. I've been a passive investor. I bought my own deals with my own money and I've been a GP. I've made 10X uh, as a GP and this, I'm not going to go through this here, but like GPs need to understand that they do a lot of the work and because they do a lot of the work, they get paid differently than the LPs with different fees and carried interest and stuff like that. So you hear about 10X in your money and that's a path to do it. Okay. But it's really important that you have the right team and that you learn from people that are in the business. And this is why I wanted to uh, finish by talking about this event that's coming up. It's in Dallas, Texas. And what this is, is a three-day event. And Robert and Tom are going to be there. I can tell you what it's not. And I can tell you where I'm at. <clears throat> I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, the best ever conference. And it's a great conference for networking. Okay. But I was never in the room. Okay. I was not in the room. And I was talking to people outside of the room and 60% of the people were outside of the room. And what happens at Rat Race to Retirement, it's a three-day event where the magic happens and the value happens in the room. And so people that wanna learn a proven system from me, from Robert, from Tom, I could tell you what I'm not gonna have. I'm not gonna have celebrity speakers and we're not gonna be doing push-ups on the stage. 
we're going to be learning a proven system on how to effectively find the deals, fund the deals, and manage the deals. And Tom is going to be teaching the tax piece. And Robert, what are you going to be talking about there? Well, I'm going to talk a little more about the timing and things you can do that your competitors aren't and why this might be one of the very best times to get started in not just apartments, but in real estate investing. Plus, there's a couple of unique things going on in the market. I think it'll be awesome for syndicators. So can't wait to share that with folks. Yeah, Robert has a great depth and breadth in the entire syndication business and can really understand like the differences between like you know, multifamily and different asset classes. And there's a reason that Robert is going to be at this event and talking about why syndication makes a lot of sense right now. And it occurs to me that like syndicators are kind of getting a bad rap because of a handful of bad apples. And I could assure you that that is not indicative of the syndication business. I've been committed to this business for 22 years. I'm committed to educating you. I'm committed to my students and I'm committed to uh, making this event worth your time. And so look, we have two ticket options. We have a general admission option and we have a platinum option. And here's the deal. Anyone that buys a ticket for this event, you buy one, you get one. Okay. Share the love. Okay. Sharing is caring. And what occurs to me, if you could do this with a friend, a business partner, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor, somebody from church, you're going to be more fulfilled and more effective in doing with doing this with somebody. That's number one. Number two is I stand behind my promise to you to teach you the framework and to teach you the three ways to invest. If you attend this event and by the end of day two, for any reason, you say, Brad, this wasn't worth it. I'm not just going to refund your money. I'm going to give you 2x your money back. 2x your money back. Now, Tom, you're also going to offer a bonus. Are you going to offer one of your books or what are you going to offer to anybody that, that comes to this event? Yeah, so so we are we're we're gonna we're gonna offer um, one of my books, uh, the Win Win Wealth Strategy, which is uh, which is the 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 new book and talks a lot about real estate. It actually, has a chapter about Brad. Brad Seven is the only person the government that has an actual make. chapter in in my book in one of my books. And uh, it's, it's about uh, Brad and how he got the government to pay for his Ferrari. So we will talk about how to get the government to buy your to pay for your Ferrari. Well, hey Tom, hey Tom, everybody doesn't want a Ferrari. You know, it's occurred to me that that was my. You know what? That's okay. It can be a. It can be a boat. Can be a house. It can be a. It can be a, a cruise, Robert. It could be a, a really fancy cruise. What about that? So it doesn't matter what what your dream is. You could actually just put it towards you know ha, d- get the government to pay for your retirement. Great. Yeah, so, right. so Robert, Robert, you're going to be there. And you told me you'd like to offer everybody that uh, buys a ticket uh, to the event something valuable as well. Yeah. So if you struggle at all with figuring out who you are as an investor and don't want to just blindly follow what the crowd's doing, I think it's important you get in touch with what I call your personal investment philosophy. We have an audio workshop where you can go through that uh, process on your own and uh, includes a worksheet that you'll uh, spend some time with. And uh, if you're new to investing, especially, but we'll make it available to everybody that signs up. Yeah. So here's the other thing. People ask like, well, what is the platinum ticket involved? The platinum ticket, you get an extra day. So the general event starts Friday at five o'clock. The platinum day starts Friday at nine o'clock. And so the platinums, we have an extra day. I'm going to take you on a tour of apartment communities in Dallas, Texas, one that I own, one that one of my students owns, and one that is for sale on the market. So you will learn about how we've bought and managed these deals and maybe even potentially see a deal that you might want to buy. So that's the Platinum Day. We also have a special lunch and stuff like that. Uh, Either ticket price, we do have structured networking Friday and Saturday night. So we will be in the classroom learning the system and the framework that I've perfected over the last 22 years. We will be learning the three ways to invest. That's my promise to you. We will also have evening networking sessions both nights. So you'll be able to connect, network, and form substantive relationships with the other event attendees, with me personally, and with my team. And so that's what's happening April 26th, April 27th, April 28th. You buy one, you get one, and 200% money back guarantee. Robert, Tom, any last words? 
Well, I again, I, I will share that this is this is a time where we need to be more um, really get the financial education. We need to put the time into ourselves because I think the prices are going to get better towards the end of this year. I think we're going to start seeing the bottom of that curve um, the end of this year, first of next year. And when that happens, you'd better be prepared. But the way you're prepared is with your team and your education. And I would just say that having been to this event several times, I remember the first time I went, Brad, and we had met and I'd seen you speak for an hour and we had been, you know, t talking a bit and it's like, okay, this guy knows his stuff. But when I watched you do this rat race to retirement, it's like, oh my gosh, this guy doesn't just have head knowledge. He has what we call seat knowledge from time in the saddle. And so you're going to learn a ton. And even if you are already an accomplished apartment investor, this is a great tribe to be a part of. The ecosystem that Brad's created is pretty special. And my favorite thing about it is not the wonderful teaching from the stage as much as it is evidence of success. You're going to be surrounded by people that have been through every stage of what you're going to be going through if you decide to become an apartment business owner. So I uh, would highly encourage you to come. It's super inexpensive. Don't let that hold you back. Don't think that that doesn't mean the value's high. That just means that it's affordable for you. Bring a friend. You never know who that might be. Somebody who uh, could be a business partner, but it also could just be someone that you have on your mind that also could use an opportunity. So we'll hope to see you there. All righty. Well, I'm going to take down the slides. And um, Tom, Robert, I want to thank you for uh, for being here, uh, Robert. Let's let's reveal. I think you're actually in Belize right now. Is that right? I was supposed to be in Belize, but I had to change my trip at the last minute. So no, otherwise I'd be in my shorts. No, I always have a suit and jacket in Belize just in case I get invited to do something like this. But uh, no, I had to Belize. I had to. Las Vegas next for the uh, National Association of Broadcasters Convention. There okay. on the police. Yeah, and look, a lot of people ask why I do these events. Look, I started by going to seminars. I was one of the most skeptical people in the room. For those that don't know me, I have an engineering degree and an MBA, 17 years of corporate America, took a leap of faith, went to a real estate investing seminar in 2001, and somehow everything the guy said made sense. And I went out and I took action. And that's why I'm so passionate about being in the education business. And my proudest accomplishment is not what I've achieved as an investor, but what, it's what the people that have trained under me have achieved. And we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And Robert, you hit the nail on the head, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of evidence of success. That's the best thing about it. So uh, come on out. Hopefully you can join us in Dallas, Texas. Yeehaw. All right, Tom. And uh, thank you as well for, are you are you at home right now? Or are you at your home uh, office? I, I, I am in my studio. I am in my studio. Yep. All right. Well, uh, come join me, Tom, Robert, Dallas, Texas, and many other people that are all, look, we're all on a journey. Okay. Yeah. You're here, and if you're still here listening, if a lot of people dropped off by now, if you're still here listening, I mean, look, we're all on a journey, okay? I've been doing this 22 years. You're never gonna find anybody more committed to the syndication business, the apartment investing business, and more committed to my events in the industry than I am, and I hate to say it that way, but that's one of the things that makes me different is I am committed, and I'll be doing this two years from now, five years from now, <clears throat> and 10 years from now. Now, after 10 years, I don't know, because I'll be in my mid 60s at that point, And I'm not sure what I'll be doing 10 years. So, from now, so I, you, you'll, you'll be old like me, Brad. Yeah, but look, Tom, you're still <laughs> going. Hey, man, you're still going strong. Absolutely. I, re retire means take out of service and no, no interest in that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, right. everybody, for being here. <laughs> well, hey, thanks, everybody. Um, hope to see you in Dallas. And um, I promise you it'll be worth your investment of not just the money, Bit of your time. I, I take really seriously your commitment to show up and be present and learn and be committed to investing in your future for three days. So uh, that's my promise to you is you're going to learn and you're going to walk away with information that you could go out and implement this year in 2024. All right, guys, I'll see you all later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Robert. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Bye.